Um, thanks to the organizers, both for the excellent workshop as well as for inviting me. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is a very simple connection between optimization problems that occur in machine learning and a very simple computational geometry question. So let's see what it is. But before that, let me set up the problem uh, by asking a far more general question. And so the setting is high dimensional data. So this is a setting where the number of variables in my model and my data are extremely large. And so in, in the case of linear regression, the signal is extremely large. Think of hundreds of thousands, potentially. And it's specifically high in relation to the number of observations we have. So I might have a one million dimensional signal and a few thousand samples. So that's the setting we are in. And there are uh, curse of dimensionality theorems, which are essentially sample complexity theorems, which state that in the absence of any further assumptions, the number of samples you would need would scale at most polynomially in the number of variables that you have. And that's if you have parametric models. If you have non-parametric models, the sample complexity is exponential in the number of variables. And so this is extremely bad, because we are in the opposite setting, where we have fewer samples than variables. And so given these uh, curse of dimensionality theorems, we have to make assumptions. We have to impose constraints on our model, even if they are parametric models. And over the last decade and a half, what we have realized is that essentially we have to impose low, low dimensional subspace constraints. And so these could take the form of sparsity, group sparsity, tree sparsity, graph sparsity, low rank structure, and so on. And so a lot of very nice work has developed which impose specific low dimensional subspace constraints and then show that under these constraints I can develop very efficient algorithms that are also sample efficient in the sense that they can actually learn the model even under this extremely data scarce uh, setting. Um, and if you think about, okay, what's the commonality between all of these different constraints and notions of structure, if you will? So uh, um, uh, a few years back, we had this notion, uh, a very linear algebraic notion of structure, which essentially amounts to uh, uh, transforming your signal into a different basis. It's essentially just basis transformation. And so this is very linear algebraic. I think in the first uh, day, people are asking questions about what notions of structure can we come up with. And I think definitely going beyond linear algebraic structure is definitely uh, an important thing to do. But what we did was we said that, OK, if you have a linear algebraic notion of structure, in other words, you uh, have a basis transformation. And then after the basis transformation, your signal is sparse. So even low rank structure and all those different kinds of things can be cast in this, in this uh, flavor. And given that, you can then, at this level of abstraction, you can come up with algorithms. You can come up with statistical analysis that just works at this higher level of abstraction. I don't need to talk about low rank matrix structure or group sparse structure and so on. I can just work at this more algebraic abstract level. And so that's something we did um, and others have done. Um, and so what's the upshot of all of this? Even if I assume this very nice linear algebraic structure or low dimensional subspace constraint upon the model, what I have are models that can be learned even in the high dimensional setting, where I have very few samples, very large number of variables. And so in other words, my advances have been in the statistical or sample complexity. But what about the computational complexity? So if you think about this high dimensional setting, P is so large that to have efficient sample complexity, I don't want to scale more than logarithmically in the number of variables. But if I want the same thing for computational complexity, that suddenly seems too quixotic. It sounds uh, foolish to ask, because if I have p variables, my computational complexity obviously has to scale polynomially in the number of variables. Uh, there's no way for me to hope for logarithmic dependence on the problem dimension. But if you think about increasing problems in the big data era, so in addition to the large number of samples, I also have a large number of variables. Right? So if you give me more samples, I can always give you a more complex model. Right? So I can always scale my models, uh, which are only limited by our imagination, and uh, give you such a complex model that the P is very large. So 
The question is, can we actually do something by imposing this linear algebraic structure? Can you actually reduce the dependence on, on the number of variables? So that's the question we wanted to ask. And the question is how? Um, so if you think about how we might go about doing this, let's focus on a very simple structure, that of sparsity. Okay, so this is a setting I want to work with. So I have a optimization problem. And so this, uh, think of this in the context of learning as learning a statistical model where the parameters are w. And this w is in a p-dimensional Euclidean space. So the number of parameters of variables are, w, are, are p. So p is very large. And in this setting, I'm going to assume that this uh, optimization problem that I care about is, has nice properties. We can start off with these nice properties, that it's convex and it's smooth. So specifically, its gradient is Lipschitz. We can relax these assumptions, but let's just work with these extremely simple and niceness properties. And what's more, I'm going to assume that the minimum of this objective is sparse. Specifically, it has only s non-zero entries. So even though p may be very large, so it li the ambient space is uh, very huge, but the number of non-zero entries of w star are very small. Think of them as constant or scaling logarithmically in p, for instance. And they're also bounded. I don't want extremely spiky optima. Okay, so this is the setting. And under the setting, I want to think of optimization and doing optimization in a manner that has a more graceful dependence on p. Now, if I think about the usual approaches, they are going to scale polynomially in the number of variables, in the number of parameters p. Right? Uh, the best possible thing I can do is linear. But typically, it's cubic and so on. Right? So what can I do? So why is there any hope at all of me to improve something that's polynomial in P. The hope is this last line over here. Right? So even though the ambient space is huge, the optima, optimum, I know, lies in a lower dimensional subspace. That's information that I'm giving you a priori. The question is, can you use that information to zero in on that subspace? If you are able to zero in on these S non-zero entries, then you have reduced the dimensionality of the problem to S. And then you can just optimize in this lower dimensional subspace. And that's the very high level intuition, possibly quixotic, but at least something we can ask. Can we do this? And if we want to do something like this, we have to focus on this lower dimensional subspace constraint. And in this specific case, we are focusing on sparsity. So a very natural algorithm to think about is coordinate descent. In coordinate descent, this is the algorithm. It's extremely simple. You focus on optimizing one coordinate at a time. So even though you have p coordinates, p variables, or uh, parameters here, I'm going to focus on optimizing one coordinate at a time. So here, uh, what we have is cyclic coordinate descent. Because what I'm going to do is, given these p coordinates, I'm going to cycle through these p coordinates one at a time. Okay. So at, uh, let's say, this step, I'm at coordinate j. What I'm going to do is just solve this one-dimensional optimization problem. I'm just going to find the weight alpha that uh, along the jth coordinate that uh, optimizes, that minimizes this specific loss function that I care about. It's extremely myopic, focusing on one coordinate. And then given this, I update my weight vector and continue. Continue with the second coordinate, and so on. So these are actually extremely popular in large-scale optimization problems because they reduce a very high-dimensional problem to a one-dimensional optimization problem. And one-dimensional optimization problems are something that we can all do very easily. And so this is cyclic coordinate descent. And if you think about the computational complexity of cyclic coordinate descent, so this is very popular. Uh, uh, again, because if I think about it at a step-by-step -step level, each step is actually very simple, since I'm optimizing just one coordinate. Um, but uh, the problem is that even a single sweep through all the coordinates takes time linear in the number of parameters. Right? And that's just one sweep. Typically, you need many, many sweeps. The number of sweeps, in turn, scales polynomially with the number of variables. And so that's not good at all. 
right? Even a single sweep through all the coordinates takes time linear. And uh, so that's really the caveat. But that said, given the fact that each step is simple, right? you give me a one billion dimensional optimization problem, right? so, so long as I can code up this very nice simple uh, algorithm says that each step I can run on my laptop, I don't care. And so that's um, uh, uh, why this is actually extremely popular. But we have not proceeded on answering the question we raised, which is, can I weaken the dependence on the computational complexity of P by leveraging the lower dimensional subspace constraint, specifically the sparsity constraint on the optimum? There's no place I've used the sparsity of the optimum. Right? So the question is, how do I tweak this guy so that I can leverage the fact that the optimum is sparse? One way I could do that is to pick these coordinates intelligently. Right? So if I had Oracle access to the optimum, or at least, a, or at least to the subspace in which the optimum lies, in other words, the coordinates where the optimum is non-zero, I could just focus on those coordinates. Right? And perhaps, uh, given that we do not have access to such an oracle, I might at least do something better in the sense of an intelligent picking of the coordinates instead of a, just a very simple cyclic sweep through the coordinates. Right? So the question is, can I be more intelligent in picking the coordinates and hope that this intelligent picking of the coordinates will zero in into the true set of sparse coordinates? So what's something I could do. Let's think about the simplest myopic thing we could possibly do. Yeah. Can you ever hope to do less than linear in P? I mean, if this thing can be anywhere, then you have to go at least once for the coordinate, right? So, so what could you hope to do? Right. So um, think of. Once you have found S non-zero so, coordinates, you can stop. Right? That's one thing. So there are forward greedy algorithms. So uh, there are forward greedy algorithms. They just pick one coordinate at a time. And then after picking X coordinates, they could stop. So let me go over a greedy algorithm that exactly goes through this procedure, which is this. So it picks coordinates in this way. So we start with some uh, initial uh, estimate. But then, instead of s cycling through the coordinates, it's going to pick the coordinates greedily. And what's the greedy step? It's going to compute the gradient. And it's going to pick the coordinate, which has the largest magnitude uh, for the gradient at that coordinate. That that's exactly right. So this step is, has complexity that's O of P. Uh, but if I think about the number of steps that this algorithm takes, that gets rid of the dependence on P. Is this Frank Wolf? So this is just greedy coordinate descent. So Frank Wolf typically we do in the case of constraint optimization, where I have a convex hull in which this W lies. So here I'm looking at unconstrained optimization. So here, this is it. And you have exactly come to the point I want to raise, which is that this greedy coordinate descent for this very simple setting has uh, uh, these very interesting guarantees, which is that in this case, since I'm just performing this very simple greedy algorithm, not assuming um, uh, strong convexity, I have a sublinear convergence rate. So WT, the iterates WT, converge to W star at a rate 1 over T. And the constants do not depend on P anymore. They essentially just depend on the L2 norm of the optimum. And the L2 norm of the optimum does not depend on P. Right? If I assume that each entry is bounded. Why is that just basis per suit, the guarantee? Why is this not just the guarantee of basis per suit? This is the guarantee of basis per suit. This is just greedy coordinate descent. So this is not our result. Uh, I should have some. Uh, this is not our result. So I, I just wanted to bring up greedy coordinate descent. This is the guarantee of greedy coordinate descent. And now I want to bring up the point that you raised, which is that if I can solve the greedy step in sublinear time, sublinear in P, then I essentially have the overall computational complexity that's sublinear in P. Right? So that's essentially what we have. So greedy coordinate descent, the uh, number of iterations, iterations avoid the dependence on P. And the dependence on P is brought to a subroutine, which is this greedy step. And that specifically takes time that is at least linear in time. But if you think about it, it's actually a very simple approach, sim very simple problem that you want to solve, which is the, the coordinate, which has the highest magnitude of the gradient. To solve this exactly takes time linear in P. The question is, 
what if I'm okay with an approximate value? Can I then solve it in time sublinearity? And so in general, this is not possible. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat slightly, and I'm going to allow you some pre-processing time. So where I'm only giving you access to the um, uh, inputs and not the outputs. So let me now go to a more uh, specific setting where I will show that this can actually be done in time sublinear in P. And the way I'm going to do that is by reducing this greedy step to finding it, the nearest neighbor uh, uh, from some residual vector. Okay, so I have some residual vector at iteration t. And the greedy step just amounts to finding the nearest neighbor among my p columns. Now this, in general, in a brute force fashion, takes time linear in p. But if you have some data structure, and this is where some pre-processing time comes in, if you have an appropriate data structure in which you're storing these columns, um, then you can actually solve this in time sublinear in P. But you can, the, of course, the caveat is that you won't get the exact nearest neighbor, you'll get an approximate nearest neighbor. And so that's really what we're doing. And so to see how you can perform this reduction, um, let me go over something very specific, which is a class of optimization problems as uh, given on the first line. Okay, so this is a class of problems which is where the parameter is W, and into linear combinations with some inputs x. And then you have a loss function that compares this linear combination, w transpose x, and some output y. And you have a whole bunch of n samples. And you have to give me the weight vector w that minimizes this loss function. So almost all, in, in fact, linearly parameterized machine learning models can be cast, supervised learning uh, machine learning models can be cast in this form. Linear regression, logistic regression, SVMs, and so on and so forth. So this is the problem I want to solve, or rather I want to minimize this loss with respect to the weights W. Okay? Just to uh, uh, instantiate a particular optimization problem. And how would the greedy step look like for this class of optimization problems? So for that, think about what the greedy step was. It was computing the gradient of the loss at W. And what's the gradient of the loss? It's exactly, the jth coordinate is exactly the dot product between the jth feature and the particular residual vector. Okay, the residual vector just depends on your current w's and all the data. Okay, so this typically you can compute using caching in time linear in n. Okay, this does not have, uh, uh, this typically does not, computing this guy with caching uh, does not depend on p. The, Dependence on P comes in solving this problem. Okay? It's solving this problem to the left. So what you want is, given this residual vector, which I can compute in O of n, I have to look at all the J features and find the, J, the, the feature J, such, which has the largest dot product with this re residual vector. Right? Now, if I normalize my columns, then this exactly corresponds to finding the feature J which is closest in Euclidean distance to my residual vector. Okay, so here I use x bar j because I use both uh, uh, plus minus x of j. Okay, since I have an absolute value here. Okay, so that's it. So I just uh, uh, look at the two times p possible vectors, which are just plus minus uh, uh, my original p columns, my p features. And given this residual vector, I want to find the j, which is closest to this residual vector. Now, this takes time linear in p. But uh, if you can store these x's in an appropriate data structure, you can actually solve this in time sublinear in p. Okay? But of course, you have a certain approximation factor. And um, you can ask, OK, given this approximation factor, if I give you if I give you a coordinate that's only the uh, best in an approximation sense, will you still get something that's reasonable? So in other words, would you still get this dk, the sublinear rate that does not depend on p? And the answer is yes. Okay. So it scales up by a constant, and I won't get into the constant. So if your approximate nearest neighbor has some multiplicative approximation factor, okay, so then um, your sublinear rate just gets scaled by an appropriate function 
of this approximation factor. Okay, so the key ups, upshot of all of this is that your convergence rate is still asymptotically as a function of p and s and t is still going to scale as s squared by t. Okay. What is the complexity of the greedy step? The, uh, right. So that's where it comes into play. So this is the number of this is how your objective decays as a function of t, where t is the number of steps. But then each of my greedy steps is not O of 1. It's typically something. Let's call it C of t. Okay? Um, and so the overall computational complexity is this entire guy. So the complexity of my approximate nearest neighbor procedure would depend on the number of samples. It would depend on the number of variables. And it would depend on my approximation factor. The greater leeway you give me for the, with the approximation factor, the faster my algorithm would be. And here, you, I want you to think of epsilon n as some integer. Right? I don't want you to think of it as some 0 0.001. I want you to think of it as 2 and 3 and so on. Okay? So you do reduce your convergence rate by a factor of 2, but at least it does not depend on p. Right? And so that's what we have. And of course, you have a pre-processing time if your um, if the features are not already available in the data structures that the approximate nearest neighbor wants. Okay, so if I'm going to give you a matrix, you'll have to convert it into a quad tree, or you might have to convert it into um, um, appropriate quantized random projections and so on. Um, and so that's something that uh, you'll have to worry about. But if you think about it, in many real world settings, I'll give you the y's, I'll give you the x's, but I won't give you which model to use. And even if I'm interested in classification, the L depends on the surrogate loss, and I won't tell you which surrogate loss to use. So you might keep varying the L's, but your X's would still be the same. And so the pre-processing time, which is to take all the X's and put them in an appropriate data structure, conducive to approximate nearest neighbor, would be amortized across all the different applications. And what's more, another interesting thing is that all the data structures that approximate nearest neighbor algorithms use are based on random projections, or at least most of the ones. And if you think about compressed sensing, the x's in turn are random. So for instance, I might use uh, a, a random Gaussian uh, rows right, in my x's. And then I'm again going to use a random projection to store them in an appropriate data structure. So the question is, instead of generating a p dimensional Gaussian and then projecting it down into K, again with a random projection, can I actually use probability theory to actually bring it down and just directly instantiate the data structures? And that's an open question which we have not looked into, but that's, I think, something interesting worth thinking about. Okay. Um, and so that's, anyway, what we have. So just to give you some numbers, <coughs> three minutes. OK, so I guess I'll spend just a, uh, without getting into experiments, which I think is slightly disappointing. Uh, let me just go over some, just to put some numbers into how, what's the complexity of these nearest neighbor algorithms. For those of you who might not have seen them, but I'm sure most of you have. So locality sensitive hashing is the most popular approximate nearest neighbor data structure. And what it is is just taking random projections and quantizing them. Okay, but it's a more general framework where you want to think about hashing the data points such that um, there would be a collision if these guys are going to be close to each other, and the probability of a collision is too small if they are far apart. That's the high-level uh, 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 property that they have to satisfy. And their computational complexity is quasi-linear quasi in, in P. Okay? Uh, actually, it's sublinear specifically, um, uh, but uh, uh, I, I guess I shouldn't say quasi-linear. In this case, I want it to be less than P. Um, and so here, how it scales is p to the row, where rho is less than 1. Okay? And specifically, the rho is 1 divided by 1 plus epsilon n n, which is the approximation factor. And again, I want you to think of these approximation factors as just some general integer, uh, which uh, reflects our comfort level with the uh, slowness of a convergence rates. So this could be as large as 5 or something, and p to the 1 fifth you know, is as good as a constant in most cases. Um, and of course, the caveat is that if you give me a matrix, the pre-processing time takes time here, I should say, quasi-linear. It takes time p to the 1 plus row. Uh, uh, and so this is something you could amortize. So if you already have access to that data structure, this is the time. And so um, this is what we have. 
And then I can actually speed it up slightly where, um, for instance, I might use uh, some randomized FFTs um, um, uh, before the random projections. And then I can actually bring it down to log of p. The time taken to do the approximate nearest neighbor, I can actually bring it down to log of p. And uh, here is something interesting in the one minute that I have. You can actually use a very simple data structure, which is a quad tree. Quad tree is one of the most elementary data structures, which just does a spatial partitioning. Yeah. Very surprising because both of them seem to be sublinear. Both of them seem to be. The preprocessing also seems to be sublinear. Also, oh, Eps. Eps. Right. There are constants that depend on n. Um, actually, you're right. So this. To the 125th if epsilon and n is right. That's right. Is the epsilon squared, not to the minus two. That's right. So I think in the case where epsilon is larger than one, this would scale as epsilon squared. That's right. So um, or I have to actually I have to actually look at it. I'm not hundred percent sure if it would scale as epsilon squared, but you're right. So in the case where epsilon is greater than one, this would be something slightly different. This would this would be super linear in P, and you're right. Um, um, so the typical setting that approximate nearest neighbor uh, data structures and analysis are uh, done is in a setting where epsilon nn is very close to zero. And that's not the setting we are in. Uh, so here is something that I just wanted to quickly touch upon. Um, in the case where, uh, if I'm using a very simple data structure, which is quad trees, and I do not encourage you to use this data structure, right, because it's very simple. And you should ideally do something better, such as locality sensitive hashing. But the important thing is that if I assume a mutual incoherence condition on my, on my measurement vectors, in other words, the feature uh, vector columns, so long as the dot product is not too large, then I can show that the quadri actually works in the sense that the time it takes is actually sublinear. So, um, uh, again, I guess there is some typo here, uh, which I'll have to work out exactly what it is. But uh, uh, it is sublinear in P. But the constants here are actually quite bad. Okay, so the, uh, the disappointing thing are the experiments where we are able to beat greedy wonderfully. Um, so let me just, in the minus one seconds I have, let me just show you um, these experiments. So. This, I think, is just logistic regression. And I'm just comparing cyclic coordinate descent, which is just doing this dumb sweep through all the coordinates, a vanilla greedy, which at each step picks the coordinate by looking at all the coordinates of the gradient and picking the best coordinate, and our uh, algorithm where we use a locality-sensitive hashing data structure to do approximate nearest neighbor. And what you see is that we do do better than greedy, definitely. Greedy is extremely slow. But uh, uh, we beat cyclic coordinate descent only by a little bit. But, and again, the axes here are kind of uh, scaled badly because of the badness of greedy, vanilla greedy. But this is still appreciable. And what this says is that even using cyclic coordinate descent, you could be essentially far away from the optimum for an almost infinite amount of time. And using this actually better algorithm uh, gets you a much better optimum. But still, it's not as good as we expected. And that's because we didn't really tweak the LSH data structures. And that, I think, is a very interesting open problem. Um, what's the storage used here? Um, the storage is quasi-linear in P. Um, so I'll just um, summarize. So uh, what I've given you, modulo some pre-processing, or perhaps it's already available to you in the appropriate data structures, an optimization method that has computational complexity that's sublinear in P. So this was very surprising when we brought this up initially, but um, uh, you can show very easily that this does give you uh, this nice um, uh, sublinear dependence. And what we did was just a very simple connection to approximate nearest neighbors. And I think this opens up a lot of very interesting open problems in constructing data structures for approximate nearest neighbors to the uh, uh, service of optimization. And again, the setting here is different from the conventional ANN setting, where they want multiplicative factors that are very close to 1. Whereas here, we are fine with larger multiplicative factors. And one other thing that I wanted to mention is that you can also think of this as a way to extend sketching 
to high dimensional problems. <laughs> Normally when we think of sketching, so let's say I want to solve a linear system, y is equal to x times theta, we look at the setting, for instance, uh, David Woodruff talked about the first day, the number of rows are more than the number of columns. And so then I can talk about subsampling, for instance, a set of rows appropriately. But if I have a, a, a wide matrix where P is very large, you don't want to even think about subsampling, especially if only a few of these columns are relevant. The theta is sparse, right? If you subsample, you're already doing the wrong thing, right? So the question is, how do I sketch? And it's not obvious. And what this brings about is that you can use sketching to solve a subroutine, and that's fine. And I'll solve it.